Hey, welcome everybody. So happy to be with you. Uh, there's a certain irony, I think, in having a virtual conference that is supposed to be focused on the real presence. <laughs> Uh, but God has, God has always a good sense of humor. I know that in his providence, this has got to be perfect in some way. And so uh, we'll, we'll move forward with that in mind. This year's theme, as you're probably all aware, is As I Have Loved You. And it's taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 13, verse 34, which says, I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, you should also love one another. Think about what Jesus is saying. He's giving us a new commandment. I mean, you think of the Ten Commandments, you know, on the stone tablets, and here we have a new commandment. And in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, if you remember, that's when Jesus was sort of being challenged, being asked, like, well, what's the most important commandment? And he said, you know, it's, it's to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And here he is raising this to a new level. Um, as Christ has loved us. That is how we're called to love one another. I mean, that, that is really quite remarkable. And this new commandment is really a call by Jesus to imitate him. As I have loved you, so you should also love one another. Um, as I prayed about the theme and asked the Holy Spirit for understanding, the title of the talk seemed to pop into my mind, and I was asked, what's your title of your talk? <laughs> I said, My Imitation of Christ. And that's what came to me. And uh, I'd ask you now, by the way, I know you, you might be in a room, you, you, I don't know who you're with, you might be by yourself. Um, I'd like you to say the title of the talk out loud right now. The title of the talk is My Imitation of Christ. And the reason for me asking you to do that is to make it more personal, because this is about your imitation of Christ ultimately. And so I'm hoping that the title will challenge each of us to consider more deeply what it means to imitate Christ in each of our lives. So as Divine Providence would have it, there's also a wonderful little spiritual book by the name, it's actually the same name, My Imitation of Christ. It's by the Confraternity of the Precious Blood. It's actually published by Tan Books, uh, which, by the way, we're blessed to have, you know, Catholic Company, Tan Books, Goodwill Publishers. They're all here in our Diocese of Charlotte, which is really quite remarkable and, a, and a, a just a tremendous blessing. Um, I have a lot to do with, uh, with uh, Goodwill Publishing, and I know Connor Gallagher and the Gallagher family and so forth. Um, but I will tell you that for probably the last 30 years, I have been giving away these two little books. Um, one is My Imitation of Christ, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. And the other is Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence, The Secret to Peace and Happiness. It's by, by Saint Jean, Saint, uh, Father Jean Saint de Jour and by Saint Claude de Colombier, who, by the way, was the spiritual director, director to uh, Saint Margaret Mary of the Sacred Heart. Um, both of them are by Tan. So you might be thinking, okay, this is an advertisement for Tan books. It, it's actually not. Um, I've been giving these out for 30 years. I have probably given out thousands of these books. And partly why I like them, and by the way, I've, I've given these out to pro athletes and you know, the athletes that I've worked with over my life, um, many who are not Catholic. Um, these are very Catholic books, but uh, they're also very scripturally based and they're profound. And they have just such great substance and truth in them. Um, they are truly inspired works. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about this one in a moment. Uh, but, they're, but they're wonderful. And I, and I don't know about you, I'm, I'm kind of a simple person. Um, some people can read tomes and get deep into, you know, deep theology and so forth. These are very simple books. Um, I can open this book almost anywhere, and as soon as I read it, I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 that, that, that's true, that's true. And it's like a reminder for me. So I've, I found these to be just invaluable in my life, and uh, those that I've shared it with have, have felt the same way. Um, so my imitation of Christ... Again, the, the title that came to me, I wasn't thinking of the book when I said the title, but then I realized uh, this is like a remarkable little book. Uh, and, and just to kind of share with you a little bit what I, what I guess I like most about it is uh, I'll read the first paragraph of the foreword to you by Monsignor Fry, and it begins this way. The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis needs no introduction. For five centuries, it has been the most popular spiritual book, second only to sacred scriptures. Thomas Akempis presents the fundamental principles of the spiritual life. The Christian soul is invited to follow Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. As we study its contents, we are convinced that without the way, there is no going. Without the life, 
there is no real living, and without the truth, there is no real knowing. And it's just, again, a deep book, and it's so well organized. Uh, I think that's one of the things I like most about it. Uh, so just to give you a little idea, uh, they have a reading guide in the back of it, and uh, you probably can't see that, but um, what I like about this, it's almost like a little spiritual direction in, in some way. It asks all these questions, and you can see these are very small pages, but there's questions, questions, and questions. Things like, are you in adversity? Uh, are you discouraged? Are you impatient? Do you suffer? Uh, do you lack zeal? Uh, you know, would you have knowledge of heaven? Uh, you know, would you be more humble? So these are questions that you might have in your own personal life. And what's beautiful about it is that the book is broken up into these, these short little chapters, which I'll sh show you and share with you in a moment. So under, like, for example, are you in adversity? You know, read book one, chapter 12, 13, and 16, chapter three, uh, book, book three, chapter 57. So what it does is, based on the question, the concern you might be having, the thing you might be struggling with in your own life, this, this helps you and it, and it guides you to some real great insights uh, related to those particular areas. So, for example, um, at the beginning of every chapter, by the way, are these beautiful pen and ink drawings. Uh, they were done by a renowned Armenian artist by the name of Ariel, uh, I think it's uh, Agemian. And uh, they're just beautiful. Uh, I, I particularly like pen and ink art and so forth, uh, but these are, these are profound. These are beautiful. And then a chapter. When you hear a chapter, you might be daunted. Oh, my gosh, he, he said all these chapters. Okay, so here's the size of the book. There's the first page of the chapter, and it's not even half of the second page of the chapter. So most of these chapters are like two pages long, probably, on average. And just to give you an idea, this one just happens to be chapter 8, and the title is The Oblation of Christ on the Cross and the Resignation of Ourselves. So it begins with, in a sense, the words of Christ. As I willingly offered myself to my God, to my Father, for my, thy sins, and with thy hand stretched out upon the cross, and my body naked, so that nothing remained in me which was not turned into sacrifice to appease the divine wrath. Even so, must thou willingly offer thyself to me daily in Mass for a pure and holy oblation, together with all thy powers and affections, and intimately as thou art able. What do I require more of thee? than that thou endeavor to resign thyself entirely to me. Whatsoever thou givest besides thyself, I regard not. For I seek not thy gift, but thyself. So again, just real poignant, short things that sort of get you thinking and remind you very often. You might know the stuff, and then it just brings you back and gives you that awareness and help. Um, the uh, contents are really well done if you're looking for a particular subject or title. And then the book itself is broken down into... Uh, four uh, just really lovely chapters. The first one is on the useful admonitions for the spiritual life. The second book is admonitions concerning interior things. Uh, the book three is interior consolation. And book four, if I'm not mistaken, is the Blessed Sacrament. So uh, again, very small little book, easy to read, beautiful little artwork in it. Um, and I've, I've just found it to be very helpful uh, over the years and, and so handy and easy to keep with us, especially in a tech world where everything is on a phone. It's almost it's smaller than a phone, so it's kind of easy to have with you in your pocket, pocketbook or wherever, wherever you might have it on your nightstand or whatever it might be. Um, so John, as I have loved you and the commandment, I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. And how has Christ loved us? He died for us on a cross in the most brutal and horrific fashion. He also rose from the dead. And how are we called to imitate him? Christ summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. One of the paradoxes of life is something, you know, opposite of what you think might be true, um, and which is abhorrent to our human nature, is that the only time we will ever be truly happy, filled with peace and joy, is when we accept sacrifice and suffering in our lives. While the times we try to avoid or reject sacrifice and suffering, and by the way, I say try, because there is no getting out of pain in this life. Uh, it's going to come to you in one way or another. You're going to be asked of some kind of sacrifice in your life. There's no way to get through this life without it. So while the times we try to avoid or reject the sacrifice of suffering, 
in favor of pursuing what we believe in our own self-centered way will be our pleasure, in fact, will leave us empty and quite possibly in intolerable pain. Um, I'll make the maybe analogous or a way of kind of demonstrating it to you. I want you to imagine for me right now somebody that you love, somebody that you love so much that you would actually die for them. Okay? You got somebody in your mind? Somebody you would die for, you love them that much. Now, I want you to pretend you're in this room because we're not together, but pretend you're in this room right now. And that person who you just told me that you love, that you would die for, I don't know how this happens, is sitting up here on this podium. And suddenly, this podium just burst into flames, engulfed in flames instantly. Are you going to come up here and help this person off? Now, I can't hear you or look at your reaction, but I've done this before with large groups of people. And I usually don't get a very enthusiastic, yes, I, I kind of hear people say, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm not feeling very good right now if I'm the person up here on this podium. I, I want to know that you are going to rush up here and help me off. So I'm asking you now, even if you're alone or if you're with a group of people, I am asking you out loud, with intensity, if you mean it, yes or no, would you help this person off? I'm hoping it was a very loud yes, definitive, no doubt. I'm going to help this person off, okay. Now, when you come up here, and you are helping this person off that you love, I'm telling you right now, you are going to get burned right down to the bones in your wrist. You still going to do it? Yes or no? A definitive yes or no? I'm trusting that you all said yes. Now think about this. If I came to where you are right now, and I walked in, I had a flamethrower, and I, I burn your wrist right down to the bone, you are going to go crazy. I mean, you're going to roll on the floor, you're going to scream, you're going to run outside, you're, you're going to roll, you're going to try to get water, you, you might tackle me, right? It, 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 here's the point. Same pain, same burn. One you can take, one you can't take. Pain without a purpose is intolerable to human beings. We can't take it. So really, the question we all have to ask ourselves in life is, what is a strong enough purpose? What is it that will allow me to be able to take on the sacrifices that are presented to me in my life, to, to endure the pain and suffering that may come my way. What is strong enough for me to be able to do that? So I'm going to maybe jump down here. In, in St. John Paul II's apostolic letter, Salvifici Dolores, which is on the meaning of Christian uh, human suffering, the Christian meaning of human suffering, it clearly expounds the dignity and the salvific power of suffering. And St. John Paul II writes, the answer which comes through the sharing, by the way, of the interior encounter with the master is in itself more than the mere abstract answer to the question about the meaning of suffering. For it is above all a call, a vocation. Christ does not explain in the abstract the reasons for suffering. But before, but he explains not in abstract ways, but before all else, he says, follow me, come, Take part through your suffering in this work of saving the world, a salvation achieved through my suffering, through my cross. So gradually as the individual comes up, takes up this cross, spiritually uniting himself to the cross of Christ, the salvific meaning of suffering is revealed before him. He does not discover this meaning at his own human level, but at the level of the suffering of Christ. At the same time, however, from this level of Christ, the salvific meaning of suffering descends to the man's level and becomes, in a sense, the individual's personal response. It is then that man finds his suffering and interior peace and spiritual joy. St. Paul speaks of such joy in the letter to the Colossians. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. A source of joy is found in the overcoming of the sense of the uselessness of suffering that pain without a purpose that I talked about, a feeling that is sometimes strongly rooted in our, in our human suffering. This feeling not only consumes a person interiorly, but at times it, it, it makes them seem like a burden to others. The person feels condemned to receive help and assistance from others, and at the same time seems useless to themselves. The discovery of the salvific meaning of suffering in union with Christ transforms this depressing feeling. Faith in sharing in the suffering of Christ 
belongs with it the interior certainty that the suffering person completes what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And this refers to St. Paul's writing in Colossians 1.24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. This does not mean that Christ's death on the cross was in any way incomplete or insufficient. There is nothing that can be added to it. Rather, it refers to the application of the merits of Christ's passion to individual souls. It is in this aspect of redemption which St. Paul speaks. This refers to the certainty that in the spiritual dimension uh, of the work of redemption, the suffering person is serving, like Christ, the salvation of his brothers and sisters. Therefore, he is carrying out an irreplaceable service. In the body of Christ, which is ceaselessly born of the cross of the Redeemer, is precisely suffering, permeated by the spirit of Christ's sacrifice, that is the irreplaceable mediator and author of the good things which are indispensable for the world's salvation. It is suffering, more than anything else, which clears the way for the grace which transforms human souls. Suffering, more than anything else, makes present in the history of humanity the powers of the redemption. In that cosmic struggle between the spiritual powers of good and evil, spoken of in the letter of Ephesians, human sufferings united to the redemptive suffering of Christ constitute a special support for the powers of good and open the way to the victory of these salvific powers. Human suffering has reached its culmination in the passion of Christ. And at the same time, it has entered into a completely new dimension, a new order. It has been linked to love, to that love of which Christ spoke to Nicodemus, to that love which creates good, drawing it out by means of suffering, just as the supreme good of the redemption of the world was drawn from the cross of Christ. And from that cross, constantly takes its beginning. The cross of Christ has become a source from which flows rivers of living water. How then are we called to respond to the suffering that God permits in our lives? Suffering that comes from others? Suffering that is self-inflicted? Or sufferings as a result of original sin? Well, St. Bonaventure relates that St. Francis of Assisi was afflicted by an illness which caused him great pain. One of his followers said to him, Ask our Lord to treat you a little more gently, for it seems to me he lays his hands too heavily upon you. Hearing this, the saint gave a great cry and addressed the man in these words. If I did not think that what you have just said comes from the simplicity of your heart without evil intention, I would have no more to do with you, because you have been so rash as to find fault with what God does to me. Then, though he was very weak from the length and violence of his illness, he threw himself down from the rough bed he was lying on, at the risk of breaking his bones, and kissing the floor of his cell, said, I thank you, O Lord, for all the sufferings you send me. I beg you to send me 100 times more, if you think it right. I shall rejoice if it pleases you to afflict me without sparing me in any way. The accomplishment of your holy will is my greatest consolation." Wow. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you. Uh, we get upset if we don't get the parking space. You know, uh, we, we drop a cup of coffee or something. You know, we're, we're, we're bereft. We're, we're besides ourselves. Um, that, that is a victim soul. That is someone who's, who's sharing in the redemptive suffering of Jesus Christ. And the story reminds me of other victim souls who have offered up their suffering for the salvation of souls. You have St. Maximilian Colby, St. Gemma, St. Padre Pio, and, and millions of others who are not yet declared saints. Like Father Walter Chiswick, if you've heard me speak before, I've mentioned, mentioned Father Walter to you. Uh, just a remarkable man and priest. Uh, his life of suffering in Russia, um, for those that maybe haven't heard me mention him before, uh, he wrote a couple of books, but one that he wrote that I would recommend to you um, is uh, He Leadeth Me. And it's about sort of his story of his life. And he grew up in Pittsburgh. He was a real kind of rough um, kid and seemed to get in a lot of trouble. I think his dad was worried he was going to end up in jail or something. And uh, by 18, he feels he's called to a vocation, 
uh, to religious life to become a priest. And so he, uh, his father probably nearly dropped dead when he heard that after, after, the, after the early beginnings. Um, but at the time, the Pope was asking young men to come to Rome uh, to study the Russian language in order to go to Russia to evangelize. And so he just felt in his heart that that was him. That's what, that's what specifically God was calling him to do. So he goes, goes to Rome. And by the time he's ordained, speaking fluent Russian, he's told you can't go to Russia. Now, he thinks something's terribly wrong at this point because, you know, he did all this, that so he got a Russian evangelize, right? But instead, they sent him to Poland. And he's in this parish in Poland, and timing's everything. It's 1939. Russia invades Poland. And when Russia invaded Poland, he took it as a sign. This must be God saying, hey, you're supposed to be in Russia. So he goes and he gets on a work car that's going deep into Russia. And the whole time he's thinking in his mind, and by the way, it's like a cattle car. I mean, I won't go into the graphics of it, but it was horrific. And this is the work car. This, is, this isn't a prisoner car. This is just the workers. And uh, he's thinking to himself, wow, when these people find out that, you know, I'm, I'm a priest and I'm coming and I'm bringing scripture and the sacraments and I'm bringing this, you know, religious life, um, they're going to be so happy. And of course, as soon as they discovered he was a Catholic priest, they reported him to the authorities. The authorities immediately arrested him. They sent him to Lubyanka prison, which at the time was the most severe prison in the entire Soviet Union. He was tortured every day for five years. He was in solitary confinement for the five years, uh, often put in a box that he could barely fit into. And uh, at the end of this, he almost lost, he said he almost lost his mind. He almost lost everything. Uh, but finally, he said to them, look, you can do whatever, you can kill me, you can do whatever you're going to do to me. I am not going to say what you want me to say. I'm not going to deny Christ. Um, and at that point, they say to him, we find you guilty, as if the five years he wasn't, right? We find you guilty, and they sentenced him to 15 year, years hard labor in Siberia. Now, by the way, in the Soviet Union, when they, when they gave you that sentence, that was like a death sentence. This wasn't like you're going to work hard for a while. This was like, you're going to go there until the work we give you kills you. Um, incredible story. I can't go through all the details. He arrives at this work camp. He's put in the bottom of a coal ship. Five years, you know, five years, no physical activity. He's been in, in tortured in, in this solitary confinement. He's put in the bottom of a coal ship with a conveyor belt up top pouring in coal. And he's given this shovel, and he's told to spread the coal. And if you don't spread the coal, it piles up and buries you. Uh, and then they just put somebody, I guess, on top of you. So he's, he's been doing nothing for these five years, right? After eight hours, he said his body is numb. He has the shovel under his arm, and he's trying to spread the coal with his, with his body at this point. And he's in there for 15 hours the first day. When you go back to camp, they strip search you. He's got no clothes on. It's Siberia. How is he even living through the strip search for the hour out there outside the camp with no clothes on? One thing after another, I could keep going. Uh, each paragraph of this book, you're saying, how did he live through that paragraph? It's an amazing story, though, and I thought that I would just share with you what, what he had to say about that experience. How he, what did he do with that suffering that he had that entire time? And really, it's about the perfection of this eternal present moment. It sounds like a contradiction, eternal present moment. It's the present moment. But all of time is present to God, you know? That's, that's the whole point to, to the present moment, is that God has no past, he has no future. So to the degree we remain in the present moment is the degree we remain in union with God. If we ruminate about the past or we get anxious about the future, we've left him because he's not in the future or in the past. He's now, here, all of time is present to God. So to the degree we remain in the present moment is the degree we remain in union with God. And so Father Chiswick, after all of that thing I just told you about, I told you about all that so you'd have some perspective on like what he actually had to say. But in his book, here's what he wrote. To me, faith says that God has a special purpose, a special love, a special providence for all those he has created. The circumstances of each day of our lives, of every moment of every day, are provided to us by him. It means, for example, that every moment of our life has a purpose, that every action of ours, no matter how dull or routine or trivial it may seem in itself, has a dignity and worth beyond human understanding. No man's life is insignificant in God's sight, nor are his works insignificant, no matter what the world or his neighbors or his family or his friends may think about them. Yet what a terrible responsibility is here, for it means that no moment can be wasted, 
No opportunity missed. Since each has a purpose in man's life, each has a purpose in God's plan. For what can ultimately trouble the soul that accepts every moment of every day as a gift from the hands of God and strives always to do His will? If God is for us, who can stand against us? Nothing, not even death, can separate us from God. Nothing can touch us that does not come from His hand. Nothing can trouble us because all things come from His hand. Wow. Again, the suffering that He took on, the, the willingness to give all to God, for God, His willingness to imitate Christ in those camps, bringing them whatever comfort he could, whatever sacraments he could, uh, is a remarkable example for us. We're called to the same kind of imitation. We may never be put in Siberia, but in our own lives, we are called to the same imitation. And in order to imitate Christ, to know him in the most profound way, to be one with him in redemptive suffering, to be more perfectly in love with him and with one another, we need His grace. And we often pray that God will give us the grace to love and, 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 and suffer for the salvation of souls as if He's distributing it with like an eyedropper. I suggest that a better and more effective prayer would be to ask God to open our hearts and minds and help us to accept His grace that is raining down like Niagara Falls. If we were empty vessels, we would be filled to overflowing with His grace. But instead, we often stand under it with our umbrellas up, blocking the grace that is raining down from above. We then complain that we are not getting wet, not being filled, that God is not answering our prayer. And by the way, the umbrellas are all the distractions that we put up to prevent the grace from reaching us, from filling us to overflowing. So let us put down our umbrellas and we will be drenched with God's grace. The ultimate sustaining grace that Jesus gives us is his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, his real presence. Now, I, I, God, God has put me in places my entire life I have no business being. I, I, I sometimes wonder, how did I get here? How is this happening to me in some way? Um, my wife Mary and I were invited to a dinner several years ago uh, with the Prime Minister of Estonia. I mean, go figure that out, right? I mean, <laughs> how do you even make that up? And we're at the dinner, and I'm sitting at the table next to uh, one of the ministers of education that had come. And what you should know about Estonia, maybe to start with, is two things maybe jumped out at me. Uh, the first one is only about 15% of the country even believes in a higher being. Uh, the other 85% are either agnostic or atheist. Uh, which is pretty amazing to think about that. And the other is that they're one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. Um, I mean, everything is technology. I mean, everything about you, it's a little big brotherish, you know? I mean, your, your health, your finances, I mean, everything about you is on a chip uh, and, and is, you know, everything's documented and tracked in, in different ways. So anyway, I, I say to him, just to make kind of conversation at the dinner, um, I had pulled out my phone and I said, you know, one of the things that we're finding is that just in recent years, the increase of anxiety and depression and suicide ideation uh, among young people has just skyrocketed. And I said, I, you know, I'm thinking it has to do with the fact that we're burying ourselves in this technology, believing that we're with everybody, because we're supposedly with millions of people, um, and yet we're alone. We're, we're isolated, in, in, in a sense. So I said to him, are you, are you seeing the same thing in your country? I said, yes, yes, we're seeing the same thing. So then I thought, well, maybe he has a different answer for it. So I said, well, what do you attribute it to? And then he got kind of guarded, and he said, well, you know, we're researching that or something. I don't know if that's the old Soviet thing coming in there where, you know, he was a little guarded telling me information. Um, and I said, well, if this is true, if this, if this device here is contributing to this, can you imagine when we're all wearing kind of virtual glasses and goggles what it's going to be like? As a matter of fact, have you ever seen the commercials? They're, they're like, <laughs> they're like so ridiculous. They'll show a group of 10 people at a party. One person has the goggles on and everybody's supposedly laughing with them. They got goggles on. The other people are laughing at them. I mean, it, there's, no, there's no connection at all, right? So I said, can you imagine when we have these goggles on what it's going to be like? And the guy next to him goes, no, 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 no. We're, we're like this far. And I, I said, this far from what? And he goes, this far from it being so perfect, you won't be able to tell the difference. 
my aha moment. The words that leapt into my mind, the sentence that leapt into my mind was, there is no substitute for real presence. And it got me thinking. Whenever I hear the term real presence, I tend to think of Jesus, especially in the Eucharist, his real presence. That's what I think of when I hear real presence. I'm sure many of you do too. What struck me, and I don't know why I didn't think about this before, was that we are called to imitate Christ in all ways. That means he offers us his real presence in the Eucharist. We are called to imitate him, to offer our real presence to one another. I had never thought of myself as real presence. I had never thought of the people that I'm meeting and talking to as being real presence. And obviously, there's the divine that we're talking about. We're not claiming to be God in any way. But we're imitators. We're called to imitate Christ. And we're called to be real presence to one another, which makes then complete sense. It all fits. It's, wow, you're like, well, of course, that makes complete sense. And yet, how are we to imitate Christ and be like him, to be real, real presence to one another? I give you that new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so also you should love one another. Thanks for listening. God bless you all.